Thank you for joining me today. I'm Joseph Owen, and today we're going to discuss the differential diagnosis for neonatal respiratory distress. Let's review the radiographic features of respiratory distress syndrome, also known as surfactant deficiency syndrome. Patients tend to have low lung volumes. They have diffuse granular opacities or ground glass opacities with prominent air bronchograms and a symmetric distribution. The challenge is that several neonatal conditions present with respiratory distress and the findings on x-ray will overlap considerably. It's very important the correct diagnosis is made because the management varies greatly between each of the different common conditions. Because of this, you must have the clinical context and interpret the radiograph within the clinical context. You need to know gestational age. Is the baby premature, term, or post-term? Were there any complications to their delivery and were they a vaginal birth? Were they a cesarean section? Was there prolonged rupture of membranes? You need to know maternal factors such as infectious status with group B strep or other infectious diseases. And you also need to know the patient's clinical course. So what were their APGARs? How were they immediately after birth? How have their, how has their respiratory status changed since birth? Let's start with one of the most common things we see, transient tachypnea of the newborn. Transient tachypnea of the newborn is often in term or late preterm patients, particularly after cesarean section. It's characterized by a tachypnea that typically resolves within the first one to three days. You often see perihilar opacities. These perihilar opacities are felt to be due to engorged lymphatics and interstitial fluid. You can see fluid in the fissures which again, this is sort of a disease of too much fluid, thought to be due to lack of compression of the lungs when moving through the birth canal. So we have these perihilar streaky opacities. We can see the minor fissure here indicating that there's fluid in the fissure. Sometimes there's blunting of the costophrenic angles, which can be pleural effusions. And at times you may see some mild cardiomegaly. You normally have increased lung volumes. That is one difference between respiratory distress syndrome and transient tachypnea of the newborn, but often that's a hard distinction to make. These are both cases of transient tachypnea of the newborn, both late preterm infants, born with cesarean section, pretty good APGARs, but had some hypoxia or respiratory distress. Both were treated with CPAP and both improved without long-term complications. Neonatal pneumonia can occur in infants of any gestational age. Your risk factors tend to be maternal infection, most commonly group B strep, but other infectious processes can cause neonatal pneumonia. You're particularly worried about neonatal pneumonia when there's been prolonged rupture of membranes. And then the patient tends to present clinically with fever, hypothermia or hyperthermia, and lethargy. When we think about the classic findings, it can be almost indistinguishable from respiratory distress syndrome because you can get these diffuse granular opacities. But focal consolidation can occur, and it may be patchy, it may be segmental, it may be low bar, but most commonly it is a diffuse granular opacity. Pleural effusions can be present, and they tend to be larger and more complex than what you would see with transient tachypnea of the newborn. While it can be hard to distinguish from respiratory distress syndrome, asymmetric or focal opacities or large pleural effusions should raise your suspicion pneumonia. 
And again, clinical risk factors like prolonged rupture of membranes or maternal status are important. Here we have a patient 12 hours old, born at home, estimated gestational age near term, who was hypoxic upon arrival, was intubated. The maternal group B strep status was unknown. They had some mild volume loss. Uh, the opacities were somewhat asymmetric, sort of diffuse on the right and maybe more affecting the left lower lobe. And then blood cultures came back positive for group B strep. So this is a classic case of neonatal pneumonia presenting as respiratory distress in a term infant. Here we have meconium aspiration syndrome. So this is a form of respiratory distress that typically occurs in term or even post-term infants. Most often, the amniotic fluid will have been meconium stained, and that is often reported at the time of birth. If the patient required suctioning, they also may see this meconium staining to the fluid at suctioning. Respiratory distress is typically present immediately at birth and can be very severe. The classic features are coarse or patchy opacities, hyperinflation of the lungs caused by air trapping when the meconium plugs the small airways. Pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum are common condition or complications of meconium aspiration syndrome. The distinction from respiratory distress syndrome is really more this kind of coarse irregular opacities and hyperinflation as opposed to the fine diffuse granular opacities and low lung volumes. But again, the main thing is that this is only going to happen in term or post-term infants as opposed to in premature infants. Here we have day of life one, severe respiratory distress presenting from the outside hospital with respiratory failure positive maternal drug screen. Um, we see these coarse asymmetric patchy opacities. We see pretty large lung volumes here on the left side. Um, day of life four, we have this kind of very rapid progression to sort of diffuse opacification of the lung. And this patient did not survive. Here's just a chart. Um, that you can go back and refer to, giving sort of key clinical features, gestational age, and, and the patterns of opacity. Nice for your comparison and reference. So in conclusion, neonatal respiratory distress is a common cause for newborns to get chest radiographs, and it's important to be able to accurately make a diagnosis based on the radiographic findings and the clinical conditions, right? Always remember to think of gestational age, the delivery history, maternal factors, and the infant's clinical course. This is because developing that lead differential is gonna be essential for guiding therapy and improving outcomes because the treatment of each of these conditions is different. Thank you for your time. I hope you found this useful and I hope you will consider viewing some of the other screencasts that are available.